Hello, this is Lady Chatterley's Lover, Lady Chatterley's Lover continuation with me, Morel Bernard. The last time there was a question and the question was, is there much socialism, Bolshevism among the people, he asked. Oh, said Mrs. Bolton, you hear a few loud-mouthed ones, but they're mostly women who've got themselves into money problems. The men take no notice. I don't believe you'll ever turn our Tevishal men into reds. They're too decent for that. But the young ones belt the sometimes. Not that they care for it, really. They only want a bit of money in their pocket to spend at the welfare or go gadding to Sheffield. That's all they care. When they've got no money, they'll listen to the red spouting, but nobody believes in it, really. So, do you think there's no danger? Oh, no. Not if trade was good, there wouldn't be. But if things were bad for a long spell, the young ones might go funny. I tell you, they're selfish, spoiled lot. But I don't see how... They'd ever do anything. They aren't ever serious about anything, except showing off on motorbikes and dancing at the Palais de Dance in Sheffield. You can't make them serious. The serious ones dress up in evening clothes and go off to the Palais to show off before a lot of girls and dance these new Charlestons and what not. I'm sure sometimes the bus be full of young fellows in evening suits. Collie your lads, off to the pally, let alone those that have gone with their girls in motors or on motorbikes. They don't give a serious thought to a thing, save Doncaster races and the, the derby, for they all of them bet on every race, and football. But even football's not what it was, uh, not by a long chalk. It's too much like hard work, they say. No, they'd rather be off on motorbikes to Sheffield or Nottingham, Saturday afternoons. But what do they do when they get there? Oh, hang around and have tea in some fine tea place like the Mikado and go to the Pali or the Pictures or the Empire with some girl. The girls are as free as the lads. They do just what they like. And what do they do when they haven't the money for these things? Well, they seem to get it somehow. And they begin talking nasty then. But I don't see how you're going to get Bolshevism when all the lads want is just money to enjoy themselves and the the girls the same with fine clothes and they don't care about anything. They haven't the brains to be socialist. They haven't enough seriousness to take anything really serious and they never will have. Collie thought, how extremely like all the rest of the classes, the lower classes sounded. Just the same thing over again. Tevishall or Mayfair or Kensington. There was only one class nowadays. Money boys. The money boy and the money girl. The only difference was how much you'd got and how much you wanted. Under Mrs Bolton's influence... Clifford began to take a new interest in the mines. He began to feel he belonged. A new sort of self-assertion came into him. After all, he was the real boss in Tevishaw. He was really the pits. It was a new sense of power, something he had till now shrunk from with dread. Tevishaw pits were running thin. There were only two colliers. Tevishall itself, and New London. Tevishall had once been a, a famous mine and had made famous money, but its best days were over. New London was never very rich and in ordinary times just got along decently. 
but now times were bad and it was pits like New London that got left. There's a lot of Terrishaw men left and gone to stack skate and wide over, said Mrs Bolton. You've not seen the new works at stack skate opened after the war, have you, Sir Clifford? Oh, you must go one day. There's something quite new. Great big chemical works at the pit head. Doesn't look like a pit, like a collier anymore. They say they get more money out of the chemical by-products than out of the coal. I forget what it is. Um, and the grand new houses for the men. Fair mansions, of course. It's brought a lot of riff-raff from all over the country. But a lot of Terrishaw men got on there and doing well, a lot better than our own men. They say Terrishaw's done, finished. Only a question of a few more years and it'll have to be shut down. And New London go first. My word, won't it be funny when there's no Terrishaw pit working? It's bad enough during a strike, but my word, if it closes for good, it'd be like the end of the world. Even when I was a girl, it was the best pit in the country, and a man counted himself lucky if he could get a job there. Oh, there's been some money made in Terrishaw. And now the men say it's a sinking ship, and it's time they all got out. Doesn't it sound awful? But of course, sir, there's a lot of never go till they have to go. They don't like these new fangled mines, such a debt, and all machinery to work them. Some of them simply dreads those iron men, as they call them, those machines for hewing the coal, where men always did it before. And they say it's wasteful as well. But what? goes in waste, is saved in wages, and a lot more. It seems soon there'll be no use for men on the face of the earth. It'd be all machines. But they say that's what folk said when they had to give up the old stocking frames. I can remember one or two, but my word. The more machines, the more people. That's what it looks like. They say you can't get the same chemicals out of Terrishaw coal as you can out of stack skate, and that's funny. They're not three miles apart, but they say so. But everybody say it's a shame something can't be started to keep the men going a bit better and employ the girls. All the girls trapezing off to Sheffield every day, my word. It would be something to talk about if Tevishaw Colliers took a new lease of life after everybody saying they're finished and a sinking ship and the men ought to leave them like rats leave in a sinking ship. But folks talk so much, of course. There was a boom during the war. When Sir Geoffrey made a trust of himself and got the money safe forever somehow, so they say, but they say even the masters and the owners don't get much out of it now. You can hardly believe it, can you? Why? I always thought the pits would go on forever and ever. Who'd have thought when I was a girl? But New England's shut down, so is Colwick would. Yes, it's fair haunting to go through the copy and see Colwick Wood standing there deserted among the trees and bushes growing up all over the pit head and the lines red rusty. It's like death itself, a dead collier. Why, whatever should we do if Tevishaw shut down? It doesn't bear thinking of. Always that throng it's been except at strikes. And even then the fan wheels didn't stand except when they fetch the ponies up. I'm sure it's a funny world. You don't know where you are from year to year. You really don't. 
it was Mrs Bolton's talk that really put a new fight into Clifford. His income, as she pointed out to him, was secure from his father's trust, even though it was not large. The pits did not really concern him. It was the other world he wanted to capture, the world of literature and fame, the popular world, not the working world. Now he realised that the distinction between popular success and working success, the populists of pleasure and the populists of work, he, as a private individual, had been catering with his stories for the populists of pleasure, and he had caught on. But beneath the populace of pleasure lay the populace of work, grim, grimy, and rather terrible. They too had to have their providers. And it was such a much grimmer business providing for the populace of work than for the populace of pleasure. While he was doing his stories and getting on in the world, Tepeshaw was going to the wall. He realised now that the bitch goddess of success had two main appetites, one for flattery, adulation, stroking and tickling such as writers and artists gave her, but the other a grimmer appetite for meat and bones, and the meat and bones for the bitch goddess were provided by the men who made money in industry. Yes, There were two great groups of dogs wrangling for the bitch goddess, the group of the flatterers, those who offered her amusement, stories, films, plays, and the other, much less showy, much more savage breed, those who gave her meat, the real substance of money. The well-groomed showy dogs of amusement wrangled and snarled among themselves for the favours of the bitch goddess. But it was nothing to the silent fight to the death that went on among the indispensables, the bone bringers. But under Mrs Bolton's influence, Clifford was tempted to enter this other fight, to capture the bitch goddess by brute means of industrial production. Somehow, he got his pecker up. In one way, Mrs Bolton made a man of him as Connie never did. Connie kept him apart and made him sensitive and conscious of himself and his own states. Mrs Bolton made hints aware only of outside things. Invariably, he began to go soft as pulp, but outwardly, he began to be effective. He even roused himself to go to the mines once more. And when he was there, he went down in a tub, and in a tub, He was hauled out into the workings. Things he had learned before the war and seemed utterly to have forgotten now came back to him. He sat there, crippled, in a tub, with the underground manager showing him the seam with a powerful torch, and he said little. But his mind began to work. He began to read again his technical works on the coal mining industry. He studied the government reports and he read with care the latest things on mining and the chemistry of coal and of shale, which were written in German. Of course, the most valuable discoveries were kept secret as far as possible. But once he started a sort of research in the field of coal mining, a study of methods and means a study of byproducts and the chemical possibilities of coal. It was astounding, the ingenuity and the almost uncanny cleverness of the modern technical mind, as if really the devil himself had lent Fenn's wits to the technical scientist of industry. It was far more interesting than art, than literature. Poor emotional half-witted stuff was this technical science of industry. In this field, men were like gods or demons, inspired to discoveries and fighting to carry them out. In this activity, men were beyond at a mental age calculable. But Clifford knew that when it did come to the emotional and human life, 
these self-made men were of a mental age of about 13, feeble boys. The discrepancy was enormous and appalling, but let that be. Let man slide down to general idiocy in the emotional and human mind. Clifford did not care. Let all that go hang. He was interested in the technicalities of modern coal mining and in pulling Tevishaw out of a hole. He went down to the pit day after day. He studied. He put the general manager and the overhead manager and the underground manager and the engineers through a mill they had never dreamed of. Power. He felt a new sense of power flowing through him, power over all these men, over the hundreds and hundreds of colliers. He was finding out, and he was getting things into his grip. And he seemed rarely to be reborn. Now life came into him. He had been gradually dying, with Connie in the isolated private life of the artist and the conscious being. Now, let all that go. Let it sleep. He simply felt like rush into him, out of the coal, out of the pit. The very stale air of the collier was better than oxygen to him. It gave him a sense of power, power. He was doing something. And he was going to do something. He was going to win, to win, not as he had won with his stories, mere publicity amid a whole sapping of energy and malice, but a man's victory. At first he thought the solution lay in electricity. Convert the coal into electric power. Then a new idea came. The Germans invented a new locomotive engine with a cell feeder that did not feed a fireman, and it was to be fed with a new fuel, but burnt in small quantities at a great heat under peculiar conditions. The idea of a new concentrated fuel that burned with a hard slowness at a fierce heat was what first attracted Clifford. There must be some sort of external stimulus of the burning of such fuel, not merely air supply. He began to experiment and got a clever young fellow who had proved brilliant in chemistry to help him. And he felt triumphant. He had at last got out of himself. He had fulfilled his lifelong secret yearning to get out of himself. Art had not done it for him. Art had only made it worse. But now, now he had done it. He was not aware how much Mrs. Bolton was behind him. He did not know how much she depended on her. But for all that, it was evident that when he was with her, his voice dropped to an easy rhythm of intimacy, almost a trifle vulgar. With Connie, he was a little stiff. He felt he owed her everything, and he showed her the utmost respect and consideration so long as she gave him mere outward respect. But it was obvious he had a secret dread of her. The new Achilles in Hind had a heel, and in his heel the woman, the woman like Connie's wife, could lame him fatally. He went in a certain half, subservient dread of her, and was extremely nice to her. But his voice was a little tense when he spoke to her, and he began to be silent whenever she was present. Only when he was alone with Mrs. Bolton did he really feel a lord and a master, and his voice ran on with her almost as easily and gagurously as her own could run. And he let her shave him or sponge all his body, as if he were a child, really, as if he were a child. Listen to the next episode. Listen to the next video of Lady Chatterley's Lover. Make sure to listen to the next video of Lady Chatterley's Lover with me, Morale. I'll see you soon. Okay.